Hey, today my story will be shorter than usual. Only half an hour, but I have something very exciting for you. Oh, hey, before I forget, man, I was wondering if you could help me with something. The cashier, a kid with acne who appeared to be in his late teens or early 20s, glanced up from stuffing a bag with potato chips, two sodas, and a pack of Lucky Strikes. He stood there for a moment, seemingly frozen in mid-action, before finally responding. Yeah, what's up, man? I released a barely perceptible sigh. I had half expected to be dismissed in a less than polite manner. Feeling relieved, I reached into my back pocket for what I needed. You see, I seem to have, well, kind of gotten lost out here. I decided to take a late night drive and ended up getting turned around on all these two lane back roads. I unfolded the map and placed it on the counter for both of us to see before continuing. So I was hoping you could point out roughly where we are on here. And more importantly, the way to get back to the main road. There was another long stretch of silence, and then the kid started to laugh, initially softly and then louder. Dude, a paper map. He managed between wheezes. Are you for real? What year do you think this is? 1993. I let out a resigned sigh. I had a bad feeling I would get this kind of reaction from someone his age, and it seemed I was correct. I saw it coming. He wiped tears from the corners of his eyes and looked at me. Seriously, bro, don't you have GPS in your car or something? He asked. Immediately, I hooked a thumb over my shoulder, pointing to the beige sedan at the gas pumps through the glass entry door. Not in a Honda Accord from 1979, I replied simply. As he looked behind me out the door, I could see he wanted to make another quip, probably something about getting a newer car or something. Fortunately, though, he kept it to himself. Instead, he leaned over the map, still chuckling softly to himself, and began examining it. A few moments later, he snapped his fingers. Ha, I still got it, he said proudly then pushed his finger down near the middle of the map and looked up at me. We're right about here, roughly six or seven miles outside Placer. I leaned over the counter to see as he drew his finger away. Here, he nodded, and I pulled the pen out of my pocket, circling the area as a reminder once I left, then examined the map further. Okay. So it seems I could take more than a few roads to get back to Interstate 5, right? The kid nodded again, clearly already bored with the unusual interaction by the slightly annoyed look crossing his face. Sure, he said simply, then placed my bag items on top of the map. That'll be $14.50 for this and $28.50 for the gas. I reached into my pocket, pulled out my wallet, and withdrew three twenties, handing them to him. The register let out its trademark ding as it shot open, and he placed the bills in it before pulling out and handing me my change. Putting it and my wallet back into my pocket, I picked up the bag and folded the map back up. Thanks for the help, I said as I turned to head out the door. Yeah. No problem. I heard him mutter at me as I crossed to the front door and pushed it open. A small bell hung from the inside handle jangled as I stepped outside and let the door swing shut behind me. The sounds of the refrigerators humming and the fluorescent lights softly buzzing were replaced by those of a summertime forest at night. Crickets and cicadas buzzed loudly in the grass around the store, almost overwhelming the buzzing sound of the lights over the pumps. The sound of an owl hooting loudly echoed through the trees, followed by the loud call of what had to be an elk. 
I inhaled the clean air before heading down the steps for my car. Pulling open the driver's door, I took one last look around before dropping into the driver's seat. So, did you find out where we are? Asked a voice from the passenger seat. For a split second, a wave of confusion and panic swept over me, and I spun in my seat. It was immediately replaced by a wave of embarrassment, amplified as my friend began to let out a deep laugh. Dude, were you in there that long that you forgot I was out here waiting for you? Not wanting to admit I had done just that, I shook my head. Nah, bro, not that. Just dealing with the kid in there was a major headache. He nodded sympathetically. Craig was one of my close friends. Ever since we'd met each other, we'd immediately clicked and had stuck with each other from that point on. And one thing we both loved to do was take late night drives to nowhere, simply driving around with no destination in mind, listening to the radio, and occasionally sharing the joint one of us would buy. This is the first time we've ever gotten lost. Though, I reached into the bag, pulled out the bottle of Mr. Pibb, and handed it to him. Here, I said simply, before pulling the lucky strikes out and chucking the rest into the back seat. Pulling the key from my pocket, I slid it into the ignition and turned it, the car's buzzer sounding as the dash lights came on. A moment later, the inline four quietly rumbled to life with its traditional burble. Tearing open the packaging, I pulled a cigarette from the pack and stuck it into the corner of my mouth before reaching to push in the car's cigarette lighter. As I did, I shot a glance back towards the store and froze. A small shiver shot down my spine as I realized the kid was standing at the door and staring out at us. What the actual hell? Craig caught my gaze and turned to look himself. Dude, what the hell is his problem? I shook my head as the lighter popped back out, signaling it was ready to use. I pushed the glowing red coil against the tip of the smoke for a moment until it was lit, then placed it back in its slot. I pulled it from my lips and exhaled a cloud of smoke before answering. Feeling more than a bit unnerved. I don't know, but honestly, man, that's more than a bit creepy. I shot one last glance. The kid hadn't even blinked once. He was just staring with an off-putting intensity out the glass. Come on, let's get out of here, Craig said, echoing the thoughts swimming through my mind. I put the car into first gear and eased off the clutch, the car beginning to roll forward. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him turn and shoot the bird at the kid as we slid out from under the lights into the dark. Prick, I heard him mumble. I turned the car left and began heading back the way we came. Well, the good thing is, yeah, I did find out where we are. I pulled the map from my pocket and handed it to my friend. I heard him fumbling for a moment, and then a small flashlight clicked on as he aimed it at the map. Dude, how did we make it almost as far east as Placer? He asked with a slightly astonished tone. Longer drive than normal, I guess, I answered, rolling down my window to flip the ashes from my smoke out. I shot a glance at the analog clock on the dashboard. 2.45, it read. I let out a small sigh. Great Vanessa is likely worrying up a storm about us right now me especially. Ever since we started dating five years ago, my girlfriend had always been rather apprehensive about my habit of taking long late night drives when I couldn't sleep. She always feared I'd get into an accident, either with another car, wrap my Honda around a tree, or hit an animal. Most of the time, I'd come home to find her sitting up waiting for me. Worry clearly etched into her beautiful sapphire eyes. I bit my lips slightly. Hey, you think I should text Vanessa and let her know we're okay? I asked Craig, 
I heard him let out a snort. Honestly, bro. No. I know the woman loves you to death. And I'm happy she cares so much. But she's got to learn you know what you're doing. Plus, you two need your space. It's not healthy how much time you two spend together. I flicked the remnants of the cigarette out the window and let out a snort of my own. It's called being in love, dude. You should try it sometime. I joked, causing him to let out a laugh. Nah, thanks. I enjoy being single too much. Shaking my head, I stared out the windshield as the headlights guided our way. I felt a slight sense of unease creep up on me as I watched the two-lane road stretch out before us. The moon in the sky almost completely blocked by the trees over our heads. I hadn't seen another car on the road for two hours at least. Well, what did you expect, Derek? You drove into the boonies. There's only ghost towns out here. Why don't you try driving all the way to Idaho next time? Shaking my thoughts away, I fumbled in the center console for a moment before pulling out a mixtape. A bit of music would help me feel better. I pushed it into the car's cassette player and hit play. A moment later, the pounding bass and synths of dance with the deads that house began blasting from the speakers. Craig let out a whoop of excitement. Dude, yes. That's the kind of tunes we need for a drive like this. He rolled down the passenger window, sticking his head out the window to whoop and holler into the night. I shook my head, unable to keep from grinning at his antics. Friggin' goofball. The playful mood helped settle my mind, and I felt myself relax into the seat, the tension flowing out of my body and out the window. For a few minutes, that's how things went the road stretching out ahead of us, and then disappearing into the blackness behind us, the music blasting out from the radio, and the soft roar of the engine in the background. I shot another look at the backlit clock. Now it read five minutes to three. We should be at the highway in a minute. The thought released the last wisps of tension in my body, and I fumbled into the back seat for the bag catching it with the tips of my fingers. I pulled my bottle of soda from it and holding the bottle to the steering wheel, cracked the cap. I lifted it to my lips and took a swig, taking my eyes off the road for a split second to tilt my head back. I looked back at the road and nearly spit it all out onto the windshield. In the second I'd stopped looking, a figure had stepped out onto the road. Fucking hell. I shouted, jamming my feet on the brake and clutch as hard as I could. The rear wheels of the car locked up, and the ear-piercing sound of squealing tires filled the cabin. To my horror, the tail end of the car began sliding out. Oh hell. Not an on an oh no. For a few seconds, the world around us became a blur of shapes and colors and I feared at any moment we'd smash into a tree or begin rolling. Thankfully, the car finally came to a stop with a screech of protest from the suspension. We were facing back the way we'd come. I could tell from the black lines on the road which had once been the rubber of my tires. I gripped the steering wheel with almost a death grip, my heart furiously pounding in my chest. My breaths came in short, ragged gasps. There was no movement in the car for a few seconds before Craig reached forward and snapped the music off. Dude, what the fuck? He shouted at me, his face looking as pale as mine must be. I didn't say a word to him. Instead, I pulled up on the handbrake, ripped off my seatbelt, and practically kicked the door open. Stepping out onto the pavement, I stepped to the front of the car on unsteady legs until I was squarely in between the headlight beams. I looked around first at the road ahead, then at the forest on either side. There was nothing there. What the? I turned and looked behind me, over the roof of the car. 
The red glow of the taillights illuminated a few feet ahead, but beyond that, nothing but blackness. I turned again, looking out at the darkness beyond the branches. No movement disturbed the bushes and branches, and aside from the quiet hum of the car's engine, it was silent. I shook my head. Did, did I just imagine things? I shook it again. No, I know for a fact I didn't hallucinate. There was someone there. The sound of the car door opening made me turn, seeing Craig step out of the car. Leaving the door open, he immediately came over to me. You have exactly 20 seconds to explain to me what the hell just happened before I lose it, bro, he exclaimed. For a second, I fought to find my voice, then I answered. Someone, dude, I'm not crazy. Someone stepped out of the woods and onto the road. It looked like a chick. I thought I was gonna freaking hit her. I realized I'd been holding in a breath and let it out, trying desperately to get myself to relax. Craig gave me a confused look. You serious, man? I nodded. He pulled the flashlight he'd used to look at the map from his pocket and flicked it on, aiming it first at the tree line on one side of the road, then the other. After doing this a few times, he turned back to me. Well, whoever it was, they're not there anymore. His brow furrowed. But why would a chick be out here in the middle of nowhere? He muttered, more to himself than me. I still answered, I don't know, man. It's freaking Josephine County. For as many good people live out here, there's also a bunch of weirdos. I heard my friend let out a snort of laughter in reply, but something had caught my attention. A feeling which had slammed into me with all the weight of a pier built. The feeling of eyes boring into the back of my skull. I spun around looking back towards the car and seeing nothing there, but the feeling remained and I didn't like it one bit especially when the feeling came again, this time from the direction I'd just been facing a moment ago. Realization dawned on me, and I felt a shiver shoot up my spine, along with a flicker of fear. Oh, shit, I whispered. Craig turned to look at me. What? He asked, seeing the look on my face. He repeated, what? I looked up at him, speaking with a bit of a weak voice. Let's get back in the car, right now. For a moment, a surge of hope welled up inside me, and I craned over the steering wheel, looking to see the highway. It was dashed as I saw it was only a streetlight, standing solitary guard on the side of the road like a sentry. Beneath it stood an old, worn sign which seemed to have been shot at many times with both BB pellets and actual bullets. I slowed the car some as it came towards us so I could read it and felt a wave of confusion fall over me. Golden, two miles. The fuck? Craig breathed out as he read the sign. It passed by us, the streetlight momentarily bathing the interior of the car in light and showing the confused, worried look on his face. How the hell did we end up by Golden? Golden is a ghost town, one that attracts visitors every year to check out the standing buildings. It was a mining town, which had a population of a few hundred people, but once the prospects dried up in the early to mid 20th century, it became the ghost town it is today. Its biggest claim to fame nowadays was being featured on Ghost Adventures a few years back. Craig repeated his question, but I wasn't able to answer it. My thoughts were racing inside my head. There's no freaking way. Golden is miles to the north of Placer. There are no roads connecting the two areas, from what I saw on the map. Not to mention, we've been driving in a straight line since leaving the gas station. I honestly don't know, man. I finally answered, my voice conveying how rattled I truly was. In the car's dark interior, I saw him put his head in his hands. 
I fumbled for my pack of cigarettes, pulling another out with slightly unsteady fingers and pushing in the cigarette lighter. A moment later, the turnoff for the ghost town flashed by on the right. I saw the dark, hulking shape of the church's spire rising out of the dark for a moment. Then it was behind us. The lighter popped out, and I pressed it to the smoke, lighting it and putting it back. I decided I needed to try and calm the rising tension that was filling the car's interior. Look, however we ended up here, man, the fact is, we can't be far now from the highway. So let's just keep our wits about us, keep calm, and when we get back to my place, you, me, and Vanessa can have a good laugh over this. Sound good. I heard my friend take a deep breath, then let it out in a whoosh. Okay, yeah, that sounds like a plan. He let out a soft laugh, and I felt him pat my shoulder. Thanks, Derek. You are seriously a good friend. Glad I've got you. I nodded, then realized he may not be able to see it in the dark. No problem, man, I said. I looked at the clock. 3 a.m. Only five minutes had passed since I'd last looked at it. And yet, it felt more like it'd been 30. Time seems different when you're stressed. For a few minutes, there was only darkness. And then, a light appeared in the distance. Ha! There we go! I exclaimed. I waited to see the sign for the on-ramp appear, and felt a shiver shoot up my spine as the sign for Golden flew by again. Fats? What? Craig didn't say anything, but I felt him stiffen in the passenger seat, showing he'd seen it as well. As the street light and sign disappeared behind us, a feeling began to creep up on me. Another shiver shot up my spine as I realized that it was the same feeling I'd had when we'd gotten out of the car. The feeling of eyes on me. My eyes shifted to the blur of trees on either side of the car, but I saw no one out there. The turnoff for the ghost town approached again. I heard Crave let out another deep breath. Derek, pull over please, he said simply. His voice was shaken, and as much as I didn't want to stop, I did as he asked pulling over just before the turnoff. He ripped his seat belt off, shoving the door open and stepping out. I watched him stride to the front of the car and stand there for a minute. He seemed to start shaking a bit, and I realized just how much this was getting to him. I unbuckled my seat belt and reached for the door handle when I glanced at the clock and froze. The clock was still showing 3 a.m., the hands hadn't moved at all. A feeling of shock washed over me like a wave as I tapped it with my fingers to see if it was merely stuck. But it refused to begin moving again. Okay, what the actual fuck is going on? I whispered to myself. I reached into my pocket, fishing out my phone and turning on the screen. Like the clock, it too showed the time as 3 a.m. The feeling of being watched began to intensify, and I glanced at Craig standing in the dark before looking down, beginning to type a text out to Vanessa. Hey, baby girl, just wanted to let you know that Craig and I are okay. We're trying to get back to the highway, but have gotten a bit turned around out here. Do me a favor, and if I don't text you again in 15 minutes, text me back, okay? I love you. I spoke aloud. The fuck? Craig spoke up. What? What'd she say? I didn't answer him. My mind was racing at a million miles an hour, trying to understand. But it was like I was hitting a mental wall. I tried to think of something else as another thought came to me. But again, the same block was coming to me. As it did, a new wave of fear began to rise up in me. One for an entirely new reason than the terrifying loop flying by outside. The speedometer now showed we were doing 90, 
And then Craig spoke. Can I ask you a question, man? Ice filled every vein in my body. Not at his question, but at his voice. It was different. Gone was the fear and tension he'd had not even a minute ago. Now he just sounded. Flat. No, not flat. I couldn't tell why. But the way his tone was, it almost made me feel like he was smiling. Another shiver cascaded up my spine as I finally forced myself to answer, my mouth dry as cotton. What? He answered as we began to fly under the streetlight. Are you scared? For whatever reason, the question made me turn to look at him, just as the light whizzed over us. For a split second, the car's interior became illuminated again. My eyes locked with his. The light flew by. The turnoff appeared again. And for a moment, my eyes flicked up to see that the woman was right next to the road, bathed completely in the headlights. I finally caught a glimpse of her face. And then I was screaming, my fingers tearing at the door handle as the car swerved to the right. I saw a tree flying towards the windshield. I didn't think. I just forced the door open and leaped out. The ground rapidly flew up to meet me. Darkness. I woke up in a hospital room, a bandage covering my head and one arm in a sling. My chest felt like it was on fire as well. The first thing I saw was Vanessa, who, upon seeing me wake up, burst into tears and wrapped her arm around me. A few moments later, the doctor came in. He told me that I was a lucky man. Apparently, I'd gotten away with only a gash in my head requiring staples, severely bruised ribs, and a broken arm. Shocking for having Dove out of a car at what appeared to be tremendous speed, he said, raising an eyebrow. Then he told me the police wanted to speak to me. He showed them in, and two officers entered, asking me many questions. I told them exactly what had happened. Well, except for two small details anyways. They appeared to take my account seriously and promised to look into it. We've had some reports similar to yours. Sir, one of them answered tentatively. Then they told me how I'd been found. How a father and son who owned a gas station nearby had been out driving and had come across first my destroyed Honda, which had wrapped itself around a tree and then sung, and then lying unconscious in the grassy ditch me. They didn't say who they'd been, but I had a fair idea who they'd been, at least the son anyways. That night was three months ago. I've been at home, resting and healing this entire time. It's given me plenty of time to think, plenty of time to process everything. I try not to think about that night, about any of it. I feel like I'll go insane if I do, especially after the police told me that they found nobody else at the scene of the wreck. Only the passenger door hanging open. But I've had to, after receiving an email from an unknown address. One claiming to be the son, the kid I saw in the gas station that night. He told me things. Things that his father told him he'd seen for years. That he didn't believe at all. Until that night, when he looked out the door at my car, that's when he'd frantically called his father. As I type this out, I feel myself begin to violently shake. Remembering the woman's face, indeed a ghost, as it flashed in the headlights. The look of horror plastered there as she frantically waved at me to get my attention. The same look the others must have had. Remembering turning to look at Cray as the light flickered over, and seeing the smile on his face. A smile wider than any human beings could possibly be filled with shark-like teeth as black eyes stared hungrily at me. The same, shark-like smile the kid told me he'd been flashed as I'd pulled away. But mostly, I remember the single line of text Vanessa sent me. 
What caused me to rack my brain? Trying frantically to recall my friendship with the figure sitting opposite me, and horror filling me as I realized I couldn't think of one single memory. What will keep me from ever taking late night drives again? The three words that will remain burned into my memory forever. Darling, who's Craig?